Simon, you're live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another live AMA session. My name is Simon Dixon. If you are new to my channel, um, then we discuss all things finance. A bit of background just for while we're waiting for people to join. Um, I remember Azad here is moderating. He's going to be picking out your questions. And so if you've got any questions that come along as we go through this, then please do ask them. And Azad will try and get those out for you. And we'll pick a few of them and go through those on this AMA. Um, he also mentioned that uh, I should rem new people will be joining this. So if you could like, share, um, then the more people that join this, uh, then the more traffic we get, the more we can get the message out. Today, we're going to be discussing a really important topic, um, and that is the pension crisis and how the recession affects you. I've been inundated with questions everywhere on every social media um, and many of the videos in the comment section um, with people deeply concerned about their pension. Um, and this is a very you know, sensitive topic. Um, so we're going to cover it today. Um, let you know some of the challenges um, so that you can then start to think about what you need to do. Um, so just while we're waiting for more people to join, as I'd mentioned, in case you're joining for the first time and you're not familiar with my work, um, my name is Simon Dixon. I've been dedicating the last 20 years of my life for what to do uh, when we enter into an economy just like today. Um, so I spoke at the very first Bitcoin conference in the world, wrote a book called Bank to the Future, Protect Your Future Before Governments Go Bust. I wrote that after leaving a career in investment banking where I worked as a stockbroker, market maker and trader after a formal education in economics um, and uh, set about building banktothefuture.com to try and build a non-fractional reserve bank that eventually became an investment platform, shareholder in a hundred different financial technology companies, um, and now I've uh, been working with, so traditionally been working with more high net worth investors, building um, portfolios in the industry and making forecasts. Um, but recently, um, a video I created on YouTube on my video, um, on my YouTube channel, rather Simon Dixon, got a bit of attention because it was uploaded in 2010 and it was titled The Great Depression of 2020. Um, and I've uh, been talking on my YouTube channel, so head over there, subscribe, and you can see the archives of all the different um, content that I've been giving over the years. Um, and more recently, because of this lockdown situation and the impending economic and financial crisis that I think follows, I wanted to start giving content on what I think comes next so that people can start preparing. Um, and as I've been given this live commentary, uh, I really do feel that uh, we are going to be entering into a Great Depression um, of 2020, as, as I talked about in that video. Um, and uh, the definition of a Great Depression is that you only know whether you've been in one after three years. So I want everyone to get ahead of that. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've done as I start to talk about this pension situation is that I made a commitment to everybody. That's why I'm broadcasting and doing these AMAs that I'll give live commentary throughout this financial um, crisis so that people can start to make better decisions around what they do to prepare. Um, and one of the things I'm going to be doing is taking a million dollars of my personal savings um, and investing it in the Great Depression of 2020 to share with you how I would allocate my funds if I was starting from scratch today. And also for those of you that don't necessarily have savings or don't have a pension, I'll also share what I would do if I had no savings um, and uh, if I had uh, an income and how I would allocate that income to start preparing in the Great Depression of 2020 for what I'll do. Uh, so that's a, a bit of background. Um, and as I said, the topic we're going to be discussing today is pensions. It's a confusing subject because uh, some many people have different definitions of pensions. There are some countries which don't even really have a culture of pensions. Um, they rely on themselves and their savings, or they rely on asset classes like gold um, in order to build their own retirement, which is actually a very sensible strategy as long as you have the discipline to do it. Um, other people just rely upon outsourcing, essentially, um, the decisions of what to do with finance because it's such a complex field, um, and that can be very costly as well. But at least you get the peace of mind of contributing every month and hoping 
that uh, it can actually increase in value and pay for your retirement. Um, but there are different types of pension. There's obviously private pensions where you can contribute and then you hand that over to fund managers and fund managers take uh, big chunks of fees out of it. Um, and then hopefully it's worth a lot more to pay for your retirement. Um, also, there are government pensions and different, different countries have different types of pensions, state pensions, um, and it all depends on which country you're in. So I'm going to try and give some blanket um, understanding of the, the pension scheme so that uh, people can just uh, understand it a bit more. Um, and we'll start with government pensions. So typically, um, the way a government pension would work is you start working you contribute an amount every single month you sign up to what you're going to contribute every month then the person that you work for or the organization you work for will also give an employer contribution and governments allow you to put this together into some kind of tax efficient wrapper um, so that hopefully that produces the returns that you need so that when it comes to retirement uh, decades or years later uh, you've got a nest egg that should see you through to your eventual um, parting of the world. Um, that's the theory, but what actually happens is also dependent upon the performance of financial markets. So if you happen to contribute and retire at the wrong time, there's, this, there's, a bit of, there's an element of a gamble there uh, because if you retire at the wrong time and they need to liquidate at the wrong time, then it also depends on the value of the assets that they have been investing in. So typically, that's what would happen. You would contribute, the employer would contribute, it's put into a tax-efficient wrapper, um, and then you give it to somebody, um, which would be some fund management organization that were then essentially meant to invest it. And uh, once they invest it, hopefully they can meet the obligations that they, that they signed up to uh, when people retire. So think of a pension like an obligation that they have, that they have promises. Now, when you combine that with a government pension, this is where it gets a bit freaky. Um, so I was uh, this Friday, I'm actually, um, thanks to our community, um, our community, I created a video on Twitter and talked about um, any interviews that they think I should be on. And one recommendation was a gentleman called George Gammon. And I'll be going on his uh, YouTube channel this, uh, this Friday because he's given some really great content on this field. And in one of his videos, he talks about how essentially a pension needs, in order to try and meet its obligation, it needs to achieve 7% per year in order to meet its obligations. Um, so as long as it can meet that 7% per year, then it can try, it can, it, it can, at a starting point, then it can meet its obligations. Um, but one of the challenges that people need to understand is what does, you know, when you contribute to this pension, what actually happens to that money? Well, typically it would be invested into stocks and bonds. Um, now, when I'm talking about how I invest my funds, um, many people talk about this concept of a balanced portfolio. And a balanced portfolio is something like 50% stocks, 50% bonds. Um, but when you speak, when you um, understand that obviously, um, stocks are a lot riskier than bonds in some aspects because um, one is the you know not all are, not all are equal obviously certain bonds when you're listing to organizations are higher returns um, and they they pay a higher yield in order to for, for your uh, higher risk that you're taking um, but in general the types of bonds that they would invest in is they have to have a credit rating of what's called a triple B credit rating. Um, and that is actually a legal obligation because pensions are not allowed to take excessive risks with your money in order to try and meet those obligations. So they have to try and achieve 7% or more with um, loans or products that they invest in bonds that are rated triple B or above. Um, now, how do they get that credit rating in the first place? Well, that's done by an organization, a credit rating agency. Um, and what we saw during the 2008 financial crisis is that those credit rates, those agencies were attributing um, very high risk products and putting triple B or above um, simply because that way they can attract all the pension money. And if you can attract this ginormous pool of money, you're very much incentivized in order to have a greater than triple B credit rating. 
And so what this has um, essentially done is it's, this is made a skew in terms of the incentive mechanisms of the credit ratings that are attached to particular investments uh, because that it can attract the pension money. And so what we saw during the 2008 financial crisis is that um, the credit rating agencies were willing to attribute very high credit rating, um, sometimes as high as AAA, which is good as government, um, you know, lending to the US government, the most credit worthy government, uh, because they got the world reserve currency, the dollar. Um, and so once they attribute it to that, then they can attract the pension money. But it turned out that they were zero understanding of the risk, um, simply because it was obfuscated through such a detachment in an understanding of how risky those assets were. They were eventually called toxic assets, um, and they were just essentially given to taxpayers to um, hold those and, and, and bailed out. Um, but what, we, what, the, what has been shown is that because of the incentive mechanism, sometimes your pension might be investing in assets which appear to be lower risk than they actually are. Um, and so what we saw during the, the last financial crisis is that banks were uh, repackaging products that were highly risky and then selling them to pensions because they had a greater than uh, triple B rating. Um, and that led to them also creating insurance on top of those products and derivatives on top of those products and eventually reaching the stage where no one really understood the real credit rating of these products. And so your pension was taking greater risk. Why were they doing that? Um, because... Uh, the central banks were following a policy of lowering interest rates in order to stimulate more and more people getting into debt. And so you can see how these systems are all intertwined. You've got the credit rating agencies putting fake stickers on products, um, investment banks, uh, retail banks were essentially finding people to borrow money um, because they were giving them to investment banks to repackage them and sell them to your pension it obfuscated the risk and people were essentially passing on the hot potato and your pension ended up uh, with the risk. So in one of my recent videos, I talked about um, the real estate market crash and the 10 steps that come next. Um, and in that, I talked about this relationship um, and the effects that it can actually have um, by passing on the hot potato, essentially. Um, well, you, you very much see that in the pension situation um, at the moment because when the real estate market crashes and people can't afford their mortgage, that can lead to a bank failure. But if the banks have actually passed on all the risk to your pension, um, then that's a good way. And if they can get the credit rating agencies to slap a triple, triple B rating on that, um, then they can actually sell that. Now, why are the pensions investing in these higher risk products? Well, it's because um, the governments have outsourced the money supply to the private banking sector. So whenever they issue a loan, it means that the economy grows, the higher, the more and more debt we have in the economy, the more we can create the illusion of economic growth by pumping, getting people to take on loans, by getting businesses to take on loans, and by getting governments and central banks to take on loans as well. Um, so that creates this skew in the economy whereby in order to get more people into debt, the central bank follow a policy of lowering interest rates. Why would they do that? Well. If they can lower interest rates, then the cost of you borrowing is cheaper and therefore it's encouraging people to take on debt. The side effect is that hurts the savers. Who are the savers? Your pension. So the pension is one of the largest pools of money in the world because we went into, you know, when, when this pension scheme was actually created, all of a sudden the financial markets were booming because trillions and trillions and trillions was being invested into the stock markets and to these bond markets. And we entered into um, you know, uh, asset price bubbles as a result of everyone contributing, giving these fund managers your money and then putting them in the stock market and the bond markets, um, which is the cycle that we've seen over the last few decades. Um, but then a central bank in order to try and create those, that, that stimulus because all of this money is being contributed to the markets. The markets are performing great because all this new institutional pension money is coming in and they want to stimulate the economy. So how do they stimulate the economy? They get more and more people to take on debt. Then you have this illusion of growth, which makes people feel great. All the markets are going up and all the consumers are borrowing more and more and more. And therefore that creates means that the companies are selling more and more products because you're buying them on your credit card. 
um, and also, and then therefore, uh, in order to stimulate the economy further, the Federal Reserve and the central banks around the world can lower interest rates. When they lower interest rates, that really harms the savers and your pension. Um, so we enter into this, is this scenario whereby your pension has to take higher and higher risk to achieve that 7%, simply because if they invested in lending to the government traditional bonds, um, they don't produce the, the returns that are needed in order to meet that 7% obligation. So this whole crazy system drives pensions to try and make a greater risk in order to meet their obligations. Um, and it's all this circular economy and these connected um, products, essentially. Um, so when rates are dropped, um, you get this knock-on effect. Um, and then you have this double knock-on effect when a massive chunk is, is invested into government pensions, um, when essentially governments are always increasing their debt. Remember what we said in the economy, in order to stimulate the economy, you have to have more debt. But if all the consumers are maxed out on their credit cards because they're buying all the products sold from the large companies that um, are uh, doing this, um, that, are, that are releasing products and everyone feels more wealthy and it creates uh, economic growth and prosperity. Um, then you have these scenarios where because rates are so low, the companies, the large companies can borrow that money through schemes like quantitative easing um, and that allows them to buy back their stocks as well. So, you know, this, this skews the pensions to take in more risk in stocks. Now, remember I said a balanced portfolio is not 50-50 because stocks are three times more risky than lending to credit worthy governments. And so therefore you have the skew towards stocks over bonds because bonds are just not producing. They're below the 7%. And so you have to really push it more and more into stocks. And so the, the effect during this recession is that governments now through organizations or, or central banks through organizations and, and schemes like quantitative easing are essentially saying borrow will create money. Uh, they're using that in order to allow companies to borrow money cheaper. And the last 10, 10 12 years that we saw before from the 2008 financial crisis was stock markets being stimulated, producing higher returns, because uh, the vast majority of this money that was coming out from quantitative easing um, was going to these large corporate corporations, were then borrowing money cheaply and then using it to buy back stock. So again, this effect stimulates people um, and pensions into taking excessive risks. So we've got this, this, this pension side which is pushing the, the pensions to higher risk in order to meet those 7% obligations. And also couple that with the fact that governments um, are in scenarios where they have to increase debt in order to keep the system moving, all because money is based upon debt. Um, and so the consequences of governments outsourcing the money supply and basing money on debt has knock-on effect into all these different markets. So then governments are taking on debt. That means that they have to spend more and more money on servicing interest rather than actually being able to receive the money from tax. And eventually they reach the scenario where they have to borrow some money from their pension. And so what tends to happen with these government pension is uh, politicians dip into it and say, well, we can supplement it through higher returns or we can just increase tax rates and we can replace that later. But each year they dip into the pension pot a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. Um, and you end up with no way on earth that they can meet their obligations. Couple that with some demographic things that no one can help, that people are living longer. Um, and therefore, you've got more and more people retiring at times that weren't forecasted when they created these schemes. And you end up with the pension crisis, whereby they need to meet these obligations. They can't meet these obligations. So they have to take excessive risks in order to meet those obligations. Or they have to, in the case of government pension schemes, they have to supplement it through charging you higher and higher tax. Um, and then essentially, you know, ending up in this, this, this crazy system that we are in today, um, whereby you're not sure what's going to happen to your pension. Um, and then if you're nearing that age of retirement, that can lead to really, really bad times of anxiety, especially in a time when everybody in the world, like we are in today, 
is reliant upon their government for their income. So it's a very, very unfortunate scenario, which is why I think it's so important uh, for people to actually start planning what they're going to do outside of their reliance upon these. Um, so that's why we've, uh, I've been really focusing on um, how you know, I would allocate my funds in the, in the Great Depression um, and uh, how to actually do that. So a few more trends, um, obviously, uh, the, you know, the, the, the situation with the pension is a very, very unfortunate situation, especially if you're nearing the retirement stage at right now. Um, but essentially, it drives to this risk. And then um, you end up people trying to take their assets that they own or the pension taking their assets that they own and trying to rent them out to derivatives. And that's why we end up in a scenario where we actually have approximately, depending on which estimations you look at, approximately $700 trillion of these derivative products based upon taking these uh, assets that people have in order to try and find greater returns and more and more people speculating um, on these derivatives, whereby the size of the derivative market is greater than the gross domestic product um, coupled with the debt um, in the entire world. So there's approximately $250 trillion of global debt that's you know, in, greater than global GDP and then you have on top of that, sometimes up to $700 trillion of derivatives, um, all as consequences of when you base your money supply upon debt, it has impacts on these different markets, couple that with financial innovation, and we end up in a really, really unfortunate um, situation. Um, so really, those are some of the, I know, I know this is a complicated situation, but the, the, the net effect is that when stock markets are depressing, governments are going to try and not let stock markets go down. They don't want the asset deflation in the current markets. And so loads and loads of quantitative easing is being pumped. But at some point, people release, you know, don't have confidence um, in the system, which is what we saw during this catalyst during the health crisis, when money was being pumped out into through quantitative easing, but it didn't help con the, the it didn't lead to more and more people borrowing. It didn't lead to the, the same levels of confidence in markets. And therefore you enter into a recessive environment and therefore asset deflation then leads to a potential depressive environment, which at this stage I think is pretty much locked in. Um, and so those are really some of the trends and uh, maybe this is a good time to actually start taking some questions, but I hope you can see just through one thing, like a, a simple, how do you contribute each month? It can lead to because of the way that money is structured. Um, and the good thing is, is that we will see a monetary reform. And I've talked about this countlessly in previous videos because it's the last tool that we have, but you can see how this systemic risk um, of everything, um, you know, creating this domino effect on these different products, all because we've based our monetary system upon debt. Um, so I think that's a, a, enough of um, those, those, those types of trends. And uh, I think, Azad, maybe this leads to um, some more questions. Yep, we have got quite a few questions that have come through. And we do have a few people who have got concerns about the what's happening with the pensions and everything. So let's start off with a question, um, which is from Nick Bell, where he says, uh, would love some advice for those who have a 20 plus year, years left on their mortgage. How does the recession affect them and the pension? Um, so real estate is the favorite asset class of banks. Um, and so really real estate is the, is the drug, as it were, for the debt-based economy. Um, the reason that the real estate is so important to the debt-based economy is because the governments have outsourced um, the creation of money to the private banking sector. So the private banking sector need to find ways of lending money, governments want them to because they've outsourced money creation and the more money is created, then the more you can stimulate the economy. But you have to have more debt in order to have an economy in the current way the economy is structured. 
So real estate is banks' favorite way of creating new money and stimulating the economy. Um, and so the reason for that is because the real estate doesn't run away. It's easily repossessed if people start repaying it. Um, and you can lend a, an extreme amount of money secured by somebody's income. Um, and so therefore, it's uh, essentially the best type of debt for a bank is one that always gets rolled over, never gets repaid, and um, they just simply service the interest for as long as possible. Um, this is the perfect type of loan for a bank. So if you can take a percentage of your income, um, give that towards uh, the, you know, the, your real estate contribution, um, then mortgages are a really good mechanism uh, for banks actually having collateral behind those loans um, and uh, being able to also repackage those through investment banks. So this means that there's always a skew in many economies towards real estate uh, because 40% of all the money created through um, the, you know, the, the digital currency created to the bank um, is essentially uh, siphoned off to the real estate market uh, creating those, those types of trends. Now, what tends to happen is in a monetary reform, what you need to think about, or what I think about, is a traditional portfolio that does not depend upon the asset price growth of a singular asset class. So when I think of my traditional portfolio, I'm thinking of what you know what are the asset classes that perform during inflation deflation asset price inflation asset price deflation and creating a portfolio that's diversified across different asset classes so the challenge with real estate is that many people depend upon it and um, particularly in, in in cultural countries like the uk um, where it's become a cultural thing to own your own home it's become a political agenda you know um, of trying to make everybody own their own home in order to stimulate people into mortgages and governments create actual organizations just to try and encourage people to take on mortgages. Um, and so these cultural trends also play into, um, you know, people's desire. You know, obviously everyone wants the security level of owning their own home and a mortgage is a, essentially a derivative and a mechanism um, to allow people to actually do that. And many people use their property, their real estate as their actual pension um, and as the actual scheme. Um, and that's simply because if you look at the trends, um, you know, property markets tend to recover with the exception of certain markets which never recovered. You know, countries like Japan never recovered from their uh, real estate uh, bubbles that uh, still hasn't come back around, but other countries um, have. And so really this, uh, this, this drives a lot of people into using it. Um, and really the key here is diversification, not having dependency upon one individual asset class. So what would one do with their um, property or real estate today? Well, firstly, it really depends on whether you have the income to service the mortgage or whether you're renting it out in order to service the mortgage. It also depends on the terms that you got on that mortgage. Were they variable? Were they flexible? Were they fixed rates? Um, and so, you know, when, when people take on debt, obviously in an, in, in an environment where governments are putting policies that are going to decrease the value of currency and also put interest rates down, depending on the terms on that mortgage, it can actually be a very favorable thing to take on debt. Um, so it can be something that can work in your favor, uh, in the current, in the, in the current environment, um, depending on obviously the terms around that. Um, but if you're looking at it right now, most people in real estate, and obviously this is so country specific. So I live on an island whereby people are trying to flee to safety and therefore people are actually, you know, looking to actually move and relocate to safer areas, especially in an environment of chaos and riots and people not feeling secure in their basic safety um, in their homes. And so that can have an effect differently to, something like New York, which is uh, obviously, you know, people trying to get out of New York because of health reasons, as well as the um, unrest um, and uncertainty. And then also everyone working from homes and commercial real estate as well. So it's, it's a bit of a tricky thing to put. I think one of the, the most problematic things is people try and bunch, uh, say something generic like real estate when it's geographically different um, you know, there's so many different factors. There's, there's commercial, there's rental, 
there's houses and multiple occupancy. So you have to think of them all as slightly different asset classes as well. And then there's your personal um, home, which may not even be an asset. I consider personally the house that I live in as security. I don't consider it an investment, but most people use their own home and try and consider it as an investment rather than security. Um, so really it's about, you know, thinking about your personal situation. This is why it's very hard to give generic financial advice or investment advice um, because people's situations are unique. But what I want to do is, um, uh, you know, put together, here's what I do in the current environment to try and put together a 20 year plan. Now, if you're already in real estate and you've got some, you're in a scenario where it's most likely too late to sell. Um, because you know the or, or it's uh, and it's it's too early to be buying real estate. If I'm a buyer, I'm going to be thinking about well, let's see what happens in the depression because I want to pick up some bargains from you know uh, distressed people. Unfortunately, that's the ruthlessness of the market, um, but that's how people are going to be thinking. Um, if you're trying to sell right now, there's probably some real uncertainty in whether you can actually sell that. Um, so you're in that in between phase right now. Um, what I would explore is if you are completely overexposed to real estate, then it's what liquidity can you achieve in order to diversify that a bit wider into asset classes that will perform during a depression. Um, and then also accept that we're also entering because of the monetary reform into a new monetary renegotiation, which I'm forecasting similar to the Bretton Woods um, schemes in 45 or the you know, removal of the, the gold, um, gold standard and moving to the debt standard of 7173. Um, so we are about to enter, by my forecast, a real renegotiation. And therefore, um, being you know, really thinking in terms of not overexposure to one asset class becomes really, really increasingly important. So this video was about pension. Overexposure to pension is a bad thing. Um, overexposure to real estate is also a bad thing. Um, it's about really creating, um, you know, a, a sound, a different plans um, so that you can really become unshakable, whatever the market has. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm really um, passionate about bringing um, my approach to what I'm going to be doing. You know, at the end of this depression, there's going to be a really great opportunity to accumulate assets at deep discount. Um, and so you've got to get through this market so that you hopefully can get yourself in a position. Unfortunately, it will wipe out so many people. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the nature of the, the market. Uh, but the governments are doing everything to try and keep those markets up rather than actually allow the, the corrections that are needed in order to come out the other side uh, in, 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 in that position. Thank you very much, Simon. I think we um, there's a lot of concerns about the pensions, and rightly so. Um, are these money, this so-called thing called pension, which the government has been propping up for a number of years, in my opinion. Um, I think we're now starting to see the reality of um, things here right now. So a lot of the questions that I'm beginning to see in the chat is related to uh, some questions around Bitcoin and that being the, the ultimate hedge against any of these things. So we got a question, um, maybe I can do two so you can sort of uh, compare the, the two, but I think it's, it's the same thing in terms of their concerns. So suppose we get everyone in the world in using and saving Bitcoin, how will the payments uh, be done, which normally is paid by taxes? And second, um, a person said, I'm 57 and in real estate should we, rentals. Should we, should we do them separately? Because it's two different questions, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, if I, I'll do one question. So the first one is, if everyone in the world uses Bitcoin, never going to happen. Um, never in history of the world. Um, you know, maybe 5,000 years ago, the world was using gold, which even then um, there was diversification in currencies. So the world is never going to all use Bitcoin. So it's a scenario that I don't even think is worth preparing for uh, because you're just not going to get the entire world to use one currency. There'll always be competing currency and you don't want that, you know, to have one currency that the entire world is using with no competition uh, can be very problematic as well. 
Um, so, you know, the, you, you need competing, you need competing forces um, in order to, you know, to, to, to have different forms of money that can serve different use cases. So, um, you know, the, most people just take the currency that they're, that they're given based upon the country that they were born or live in. Um, but the cur that currency is good for, ex for expending in your country. Um, but if everyone starts price, even then, like, I don't think the world's ever going to start thinking of Bitcoin in terms of this water costs 0 0.0001326785 Bitcoin. It's just, it, we, we can't compute beyond the, the couple of decimal places. Our brains were not wired um, to think in those ways. It requires such a radical rethinking and rewiring of the brain um, in order to move into such, such a world. Um, I think the likelihood of that ever ever happening is is highly unlikely and probably highly undesirable as well. Uh, so the second part of the question was, if we move to a world where everyone's using Bitcoin, then what was the question? Yeah, so the second one was more about, um, the person said, I'm 57 and in real estate rentals, uh, they got bonds, they also uh, have gold. So they've just sold some of their stocks and they're looking for um, income streams with with those particular investments so they're a bit nervous about their stocks at their particular age what should they be nervous i guess is the question or what should they be doing yeah again this is one of those you, you it's so specific that there's a real danger in me giving any kind of investment financial advice and one i can't do that that i could say something that's not not a complete understanding and this is what you know, financial advisors and investment advisors are for um, is to take your unique circumstance and what obligations do you have? What liabilities do you have? Um, how long are you, you know, you've you got to go deep into those. So one of the things we do right now is making sure that um, everyone, so um, as I said, the, there's a real danger of me giving some information that becomes real dangerous information there because I've, I've not sat down with you really thinking about what your, your individual situation is. You've given me two or three points, but I don't know the rest of the situation. Um, and it's irresponsible for me to, to diagnose where you should do that. So one of the things, um, as I said, I'm going to be doing this, uh, how I allocate my funds in the Great Depression of 2020. Um, but the precursor before that, and one of the, the reasons this has become a bit of a monster for us, um, is because it started as here's what I do, and we're going to create a video series on how how we do that. But then I want to add some responsibility there. The reason I know how I want to allocate my funds is because I've done the homework of my personal cash flow. You know, I know what obligations I have, I know what income I have, and I also know my personal balance sheet. You know, I know what debt levels there are, and I know what assets I have. Um, and then I can take a percentage of those, your, your balance sheet, essentially your personal cash flow. Think of yourself as a business. You know, what, what income do I have left over? How much of that can I allocate towards a balanced portfolio that can perform in different markets? Um, and then at the same time, uh, the, you know, your personal assets, what, which ones of those can be liquidated? Which ones are easy to liquidate? And how can those be allocated in, in, into a, a, a balanced um, portfolio. So I, all of these questions are really centered around people want the one thing, um, you know, do I put it in a pension? Do I put it in real estate? Do I put it all in Bitcoin? All of those are bad answers. Um, it, it, it's about, you know, really planning your personal situation and then building a portfolio that can be, that, won't necessarily perform in one eventuality, but will be hedged to another eventuality. So it's all about asset allocation. Um, and that, that's why we're, we're really focused, but I want to make sure that's why I don't want to just give you blanket answers. Okay, I think uh, let, let's just, um, <clears throat> I'd like to remind everyone, first of all, thank you everyone for your questions. Please keep them coming. Um, I've been uh, looking out for some questions there and taking a note of all of them. Um, but what I would like to say, uh, for those of you who are new, we do have some regular um, 
guests uh, or our regular followers, viewers of this channel. So we are hugely grateful to you. But for those of you who are new to Simon's channel, I'd like to reiterate that Simon is not your, your classic YouTuber who's putting out contents. He is actually quite fresh to all of this, although his content has been about for over 10 years. Correct, Simon? Um, but now we're just basically uh, pushing full steam ahead because of the crisis situation that we're facing from the pandemic to now this whole recession and the world going into uh, absolute craziness at the moment. Luckily, fortunately, there are a lot of leaders out there um, who are making a lot of sense. And we'd like to think, or I'd like to think that uh, Simon is one of those people. And for those of you who do agree with that particular notion, I'd, uh, if you are new, you haven't subscribed, the reason why that we ask you is not because we're looking for, uh, you know, just this attention, but this type of information, it really is helping a lot of people. All you need to do, quite simply put, is when you're checking out the videos on Simon's uh, channel and you can see the different videos that have been put out there, just check the comments out there. People who are super grateful, um, you know, it, it surprises us. Uh, we're happy to see that, but we just wish that more and more people would actually do it. So we're not one of these internet marketers uh, who are going to be driving it just for the numbers, just to get any, uh, you know, some money revenue coming in from, from YouTube. That's far from it. The message is absolutely uh, important is what we're saying. So what I'm advocating here, we'd love for you to hit the like button, share this content with your friends, loved ones, people who you absolutely care about. If you are benefiting from what is being said right now, please do do that. We really appreciate it. And on the count of three, we'd like to play this whole YouTube game. Uh, Simon, I'd love for you to give that countdown if that's all right. And let's see that number push. We've actually got 208 people watching. Come on, guys, hit that like, don't be shy. As somebody said, there's a lot of information on here. People like to keep it to themselves, but we're trying to be of that abundant mindset. The way YouTube works, it's algorithm. It's quite complicated, but let's use that fancy word algorithm. It really does actually start reaching out the minute you smash that like, the minute you start sharing on your social media, et cetera. So Simon, let's do a countdown to three maybe from you. Okay, yeah, so you're going to hit the like button on three. Yeah, as, as I said, said, we'd rather not be doing this, but um, we found it's really working. The subscribers is going up as a result of this. So um, your help is needed so that we can get the message to more people. So on three, if you could hit the like button, one, two, three. Okay, so now let's take some questions now. We've uh, got some more likes. Excellent. Okay. So um, got a question from our regular. Let's uh, let's take a qu question from our regular, and his name is David Wright. Um, Simon, you say that asset deflation or crash is pretty much locked in, uh, i.e., bad for the pension funding levels. Do you agree? The only way out for central banks would be ultra printing, so inflation hits your pension. Um, so I, yeah, I talked about this one in um, previous videos, the real estate market crash and the 10 steps that come next. Um, I believe that the last monetary tool that central banks and governments have at their disposal um, is uh, issuing a new currency, a new central bank digital currency. Um, it will be denominated in the exact same currency. So, um, you know, it will be the dollar, it will be the euro, it will be the pound. Um, but there, I believe that they're going to um, launch that, that central bank digital currency in proportion to a couple of things. So there's a couple of eventualities here. One is that um, the banks are exposed to the, the, the debt that they've been you know, increasing exponentially over the decades. Um, and therefore, when people stop paying their mortgages, because um, then that essentially leads to debt destruction, um, and a real problem for the bank's balance sheet, um, and therefore the, the possibility of banks going bust. Um, because they don't want, um, I don't, you know, you've got deposit insurance doesn't even really meet anywhere near the obligations of what the banks are, you know, what individual depositors are ex exposed to. 
Um, so deposit insurance isn't really the answer. It's more like a, you know, of making people feel confident in the system. But if everyone wanted to claim their deposit insurance, it just doesn't exist. Um, the, the, the obligations that they have there. Um, so I don't think, but I do genuinely believe that people aren't going to leave there. I don't think they're going to bail in like they have in the past. I think a central bank digital currency is going to be issued and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's inflationary. People make a mistake of thinking that if you increase the money supply, it's inflationary. Um, it depends if it's combined with a destruction of the money supply at the same time. So remember, when people default on their loans, that's a decrease in the money supply because it, it, it just as money gets created when you borrow, it gets destroyed when it's uh, repaid or not or, or, uh, or defaulted on. So whether you head into inflation is dependent upon the ratio of money creation, the, the increase in the geeky word is M2 money supply. I, 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 I believe that it doesn't need to be that complicated, but you know, the, it's, it's the ratio of debt destruction versus money creation that will eventually lead to inflation. So um, when you, for example, issue a central bank digital currency, we'll call that printing money, there is no money printed, um, then uh, that uh, if it's actually proportionate to banks going bust and people and the government's deciding to replace people's deposits uh, with that central bank digital currency, then that is not inflationary because it's replacing one form of money with another. What we are seeing at the moment is um, bankruptcies leading to debt destruction and quantitative easing leading to a big increase in money supply that people call printing. Again, it's not printing. Um, it's simply um, ciphering up a digital, a digital currency, a digital USD, um, and using that in order to purchase assets. Um, so, but eventually, yeah, the, 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 because here's the complicated part. Most people would say clear cut, we're headed to inflation or we're headed to deflation. The reality is, is that nobody knows what political negotiations in the monetary reform are going to come next. And those political negotiations are going to determine whether we move into inflation or deflation um, in, you know, and, and again, inflation or deflation, are you referring to consumer goods? Are you referring to assets? You know, and some goods are going to be going down in prices, others are going to be um, going up. So again, it's one of those blanket terms that needs a bit of the devil's in the detail there, uh, because some, some people could be feeling uh, the effects of inflation, but that's because of the way they consume and their individual habits. Um, so again, the, 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 whether we move into that um, is dependent upon the monetary renegotiations. And therefore, you need to be prepared for both eventualities. Um, and uh, that's, that's, what a, a, that's what I'll be going through when I talk about how to allocate $1 million in the current environment. All right, thank you very much for that, Simon. Okay, so I'll do a nice simple question right now, um, but it's definitely related to the the going on that's happening, or we've seen that's happening in uh, in America at the moment. Um, the question is, I'd like to know how the current happenings in the USA are going to impact the global economy. What are your thoughts, Simon? Uh, by the impacts in US, are we referring to the money printing or are we talking about the riots? Let, let me just assume that we're talking about the social unrest. I think it's uh, um, yeah, about the riots. Yeah, I mean, th this is a, a deeply, deeply, deeply troubling time. Um, I did talk about it in my book, Bank to the Future, that the next financial crisis, um, it was called Bank to the Future, Protect Your Future Before Governments Go Bust. Um, and civil unrest is one of the eventualities. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really, really troubling time. Um, and that, you know, what, what is happening in America seems to be exporting into different jurisdictions around the world. And unfortunately, you know, financial ruin really brings out the worst in, in humankind. Um, and uh, we need to face the reality that this lockdown has led to record levels of unemployment Record levels of unemployment has also led to record levels of bankruptcy. Record levels of unemployment and bankruptcy, um, you know, can only lead to the, the, the levels of anxiety that we're seeing in countries like America. And then something happens like horrific, like, you know, um, 
a racial murder from from the police and you know the it's such a horrific event can only just bring out the worst in people couple that with financial ruin and you get an environment of people just feeling like the the industry has the world has shafted them um so it's a it's a it's a really unfortunate situation um the only thing i can do is try and help people understand that we are in a in a time of financial change and financial change doesn't need to mean financial ruin it will mean financial ruin for a lot of people um, but financial change means that you need to change your behaviors um, and that's why you know we've taken to um, giving so much more content in this weekly show uh, to cover topics um, so that we, we can actually uh, help people in these in these really troubling times um, but the US situation you know bankruptcies unemployment it's a global phenomenon it's a global depression um, and we're going to need radical monetary reforms and there's going to be currency wars in um, you know you're already starting to see that with China you know launching their central bank digital currency um, and the political unre- uncertainty and wars between uh, you know, currency wars and trade wars between America and China. Um, and we're going to see a, l- a lot more of that. I'm not expecting this situation to get better. In fact, we haven't even started what happens when the government stop paying people's mortgages. Most mortgages are being propped up by government subsidies. And that leads to a financial crisis. And that financial crisis is either exposure in the banks Um, or the assets were passed on to the pension. So that brings us full circle uh, to where we are right now. And everyone needs an alternative plan and certainly a change of behavior based upon what they've they've currently been doing. Okay, Uh, do we have room for one more question or because we've got about eight minutes left. I was hoping to either do a question or actually because it is we have short time left i think let's end on a high as we did in our last uh, ama so simon um although we're seeing a lot of doom and gloom you're seeing opportunities at the same time uh, you know you you're going on a number of uh, podcasts for us from some um uh, quite popular people on on social media and uh, who have a really great following on youtube But what opportunities, whether it's investment wise or any projects, are you seeing right now and for people to be aware of? Yes, I mean, uh, obviously, we've talked a lot about Bitcoin on this channel. Um, If you were a subscriber of this channel, then I've been talking about it since 2011 when I spoke at the very first Bitcoin conference in the world. Um, and that has actually, over that decade, produced a 9 million percent return. Now, that is a crazy scenario, but it's also been replicated um, quite a few times with uh, different, different uh, areas uh, within our industry. Um, so, again, uh, one of the things I did, I was interviewed last week on a gentleman, a YouTuber called The Crypto Lock, and he asked some really great questions, um, like Azad's doing uh, here today. Um, I gave some background. Um, I uploaded it to my YouTube channel. So I think it's probably the previous video before this one. Um, and uh, in, on his channel, it had about 21,000 because he's got a large subscriber base. But we re-uploaded it to our uh, YouTube channel. So uh, you can check that one out. Um, but in that one, I talked about uh, where we are today, what got us here, uh, what I'm forecasting come next. And he asked the question specifically, um, what will you be investing in? So Um, One of the things that we're really excited about and we've dedicated our team at Bank to the Future is taking a lot of the stuff that I've been doing over the last 10 years and what I'll be doing over the next 10 years out of my head and into um, really simple, easy to understand. Um, And we actually turned this whole concept into a complete course, which we're really excited about bringing to the market. Now, many people have been asking us um, because we want to help more people Um, Is that actually going to be free? Is it going to be a paid course? Um, And so what we've actually tried to do is think about how we can do this for the maximum number of people. So I'm going to answer some of those questions and what we're doing. Um, The first thing is there are some people that have been asking us many questions and they have savings, they have pension, they have real estate. 
Um, and so they have already prepared a nest egg, but they want to figure out what to do, what to, you know, how, how to do that. And, and so what I said about is I'm going to take a million dollars of my savings um, and through the, through the course, um, I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing with those and why I'm doing that and why it's right for me so that then you can unpack that and say, well, if I've got a thousand dollars, I got 10,000, I've got a million, I got 10 million, a hundred million, you know, it really doesn't matter. It scales to your situation. It's not, again, financial advice I can't do because I'm not doing this one-to-one, -one, which is required in order to give pre prescriptions to individual people. Um, but then some people are like, well, I, I don't have any savings. And so um, we, I said, well, okay, I'll also do it of what I would do today if I had no savings and just an income. And then people are asking us quite a lot, well, are you going to be charging for that course or are you going to be trying to get it to maximum number of people? So if you've been following our channel, you know that over the last decade through banktothefuture.com, um, we got people investments in you know, some of the highest performing companies in the, in the financial technology industry um, and also uh, Bitcoin itself and other yeah. things um, over, this, over this time. Um, and I've been only able to work with high net worth people for regulatory reasons. We're a securities business and it's restricted in terms of who you can work with. And so we've been using this lockdown to actually put together um, products and courses and ideas um, that ev everyone can use without necessarily having to be that high net worth investor. Uh, we've got our development team working on those products at Bank to the Future. Um, and then uh, we got Azad to come along and help us actually get this message out to more people. So he's helping me create more content while trying to run a full-time business, dedicate this time so that we can have free content. And then exactly the same we'd like to do with the course. What we're going to do is we're working right now on a video series that outlines it um, completely free um, for anyone that wants to, you know, and we'll be doing that in a four-part video series that we'll be releasing over the months ahead. Um, you can take that and do that as, as you wish, but then we will actually be charging for people that actually wanna do it um, with us over a seven week period so that we can dig deeper into the, you know, there's amazing technology now you can do online coaching with a group of people. Um, you can replicate some of that environment. Um, so anyone that wants that level of service that's fortunate to be in a position where they can afford that, um, then we'll actually put together a seven week program to do that. So we're trying to capture, you know, as, as much people as possible. Um, but in order to do that seven week program, that obviously has to be paid for. Um, it will be at a price proportionate to what we have put in. But for those that are not in that position, uh, we'll do that four part video series and you can take that, do with it as you wish. It's going to be great content. It's going to answer a lot of the, the questions of what we're doing um, and we'll lay it all on the line for you there. So I'm excited about bringing that to market. Um, and also what I'm really excited about is what I'm seeing from a lot of companies. So there's a lot of companies that are unfortunately going into these bankruptcy situations through no fault of their own. But I'm also starting to see, you know, um, really, really incredible innovation around people taking traditional businesses and putting them online and getting really creative. They're not sitting back and letting this economy run them over. They're really thinking about, well, what is ahead? Let's not bury our head in the sand. Let's not pretend that there's not a depression ahead. But what are people going to want in a depression um, and aligning themselves with these changing trends? And there's so many uh, changing trends. And so I'm really inspired by a lot of what people are doing, what organizations are doing, what the team are doing, what the, you know, what businesses are being created at these times. Um, and really those, those changes are what inspire me um, in these times when there's so much to be uninspired by. Um, and really, you know, you look at the, the, the changes that are going to come while, you know, the looting and the rioting and the death and the destruction is, is, is horrific. Um, we also seeing peaceful protests that are actually going to enact, enact massive change. Um, and we are going to come out of this at the end of this with a monetary reform. So please, let's use this opportunity to actually design a better financial system and not kick the can down the road a little bit further, not use our traditional methodologies um, and be grateful that we also have 
the fact that Bitcoin was invented out of the last financial crisis. Uh, we now have this parallel competing financial system that, uh, you know, thank God actually creates an opportunity um, to have competing markets and people to actually plan uh, for other eventualities. And so what we want to do is we want to do everything that we can um, to be of, of service. And that's why we're doing these you know, painful asking you to like share because we don't necessarily have the biggest following. There's great people out there. Um, I'm going to be, I, I was asking the community to help me around whose channels I should be on that can benefit from this content. And already the things are really starting to happen. You've been recommending some incredible people and we've had all these people reaching out uh, so that we can get this message further. And then on our individual level, more people are subscribing, more people are liking, more people are sharing. Um, and I think we're at the start of something really special. And I'm really glad to actually do this and take this journey with you. So that was more than eight minutes. And I think we're exactly on the hour. So I think we've done the one hour. Azad, um, are we ready to wrap it up there? Yeah, we are. Um, if you just could maybe give a very quick answer, please, uh, just regarding, because it just occurred to me, um, the in terms of the course that you're going to be doing, uh, th there's a few people who are quite curious about it. They're okay uh, with what's been said and they're curious about how much it's going to cost. Uh, I don't think we're in the position to actually reveal that just yet because we want you to actually take away the free content and then judge from there. But in terms of the handful of people that you're going to be taking them, literally holding their hands throughout the process in that seven week or something uh, process um, to showing them how you would do it if you were investing, which you will be investing uh, $1 million of your own money. And also if you didn't have that amount, right? Um, but is there, uh, cause I never asked you Simon. So is there a, is there a set number of the amount of people that you will be taking? And if you can answer that and just end with your sort of, uh, final, uh, phrase. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, well, uh, I, we, we haven't said, I uh, haven't got answers on any of these things. We want to only take on the maximum number of people where we can deliver the best possible service. Um, so we've had the whole team creating spreadsheets, creating tools, um, sharing things like how to set up crypto-friendly banks, inheritance, um, planning your personal financial um, plans. And we want to deliver, you know, this. we can only deliver that at a high price um, and a high price because we want to deliver the best quality. I don't want to deliver a low quality product here. Um, I want to put together the complete solution. Um, if people can't afford that, then the four part video series will be self-contained um, so that they can take it and they may not necessarily need that handholding. Um, but with technology now, then I think we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll come up with what is the right number of people where we can deliver uh, the exact service that we want to deliver. Um, and I don't know the answer to that yet, but uh you know, the, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with something and we'll start to reveal that um, as that becomes clear. At the moment, I'm just razor focused on getting everything out um, into, you know, blueprints, into videos, into, um, you know, real step by step, because I don't want to leave anyone. I don't want to leave any questions unanswered. I want people to have the, you know, what I think is needed in order to really d develop not just a Great Depression of 2020 plan, but 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, even 40 years into the future. Um, and uh, that's, that's what we're really focused on, which requires, you know, you doing things in the right way. Tax is a, an important consideration. Structure is an important consideration. Banking partnerships is an important consideration. Um, how do you protect from bail-ins? How do you create structures? Um, you know, this, this started off as a simple thing, but I, I, I don't want to do this um, half-heartedly. I want to do this really well. So I think um, that's a, a probably a good place. Don't have all the answers. We're sharing the journey with you. We'll keep sharing this. I'll go live each week. Let us know what topic you'd like us to cover next week. I think we've actually got some special guests booked in for the next couple of weeks ahead. You can see in the background that it's actually getting dark here. I was hoping to get a cycle in. Um, but that's not going to happen um, because we're, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying uh, giving this content at the moment. Um, do like, do share, 
do subscribe. We'll keep you up to date with everything as it happens. Um, and uh, yeah, remember, no matter how bad it gets, you are alive in one of the most exciting times or interesting times in financial history. And you want to get on the right side of that because it's really unfortunate for some people. It's not going to be an exciting time when the reality is it's one of the most interesting times in financial history. So peace, take care of yourself, and we'll see you next week and in future videos.